But don't go in thinking that, well, what do I have to offer? Ask yourself this, why are they coming to you and want to do a deal? It's not because there's some, not another person out there. I mean, unless you invented the cure to death, <laughs> others are doing something similar. So there is value in what you bring, and they know that value. So do not sell yourself, yourself short. They wouldn't and, agree to the meeting. If and the very fact that you're a disabled vet in everything that you said, of what it is that you bring to the table, bring that in a very strong, powerful voice. And you only have to say it once, that's it. They will hear you. I can tell you that I am totally happy doing deal A, B, or C. It all depends on where the other side is going. Because again, you're not negotiating against yourself, you're negotiating against another side. Here's another thing that, that I'm sure it isn't, um, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. You're a disabled vet. They wouldn't want to change positions with you. You are in the position that you are. But that position is very important on the other side. So, as I said before, do not <coughs> sell yourself short and use the fact that you're a disabled vet to your advantage. Let them repeat things. Not because you can't hear, but because you want to technically have them repeat things. When somebody repeats something, that means they want to convince you of something. Okay? Be proud of what it is that you're there to accomplish. And take no prisoners. The most important thing is they want you there, they want to do the deal. And the fact that you have no revenue, you don't have whatever, and I don't know anything about your business, it doesn't matter. The very reason that you are in that position, that they want to negotiate with you, they have seen a value that they want. I can tell you that in the past 36 years in the U.S., I've owned a fair number of cars. I have ne never bought or leased a car after I had gone for a test drive. I would go in, I would cut the financial deal. This is how much the car is, this is how much, over how many years of finance, maybe, leasing, whatever. My monthly payment is X. Can I live with it? Obviously. You know, can I, I can live with it, and this is not the car for me. But you cut the deal, then you go out and drive the car. What am I doing by doing that? Taking the emotional out of it. Exactly. And then most especially taking the advantage of the other side out of it. Because if you've been in a new car, used car dealer, whatever, it doesn't have to be a car, you name it. But something that you are emotionally attached to, become emotionally attached to. Go to Again, <coughs> the dealer's example, the first thing they're going to want to do is put you in that driver's seat because now you're committed. You know, turn the engine or push the button, whatever it is these days, and the thing comes. He's going to remind you that when you're pushing back at the financials when they come later on. And, and many people have gotten bad deals because of that. You don't, the point is, if you've gotten a bad deal before, let that be the last one. You don't have to get another one. Because more doesn't make it better. In cases where it isn't as simple as I get in the driver's seat or not, you buy a house and you're walking through the house and the realtor is right there trying to read everything about you. But typically the realtor is not your friend because even if that's your realtor and if that realtor is your friend, they make money out of that sale. So that's not a party without a conflict of interest. <coughs> So don't let them hear the open discussion. Oh, I like this, I don't like that, I do this, I do that. You know, if you're there with your daughter, if you're there with your husband, your wife, whatever. You only have phones, text them. <laughs> text them. The point I'm trying to make is, you have the technology. Use it, and use it to your advantage. Or, use it to the disadvantage of the other party.
whichever one you're trying to accomplish. You have to have a clear deal-breaking point. If there is a point, if there is a line in the sand that you have drawn and you have gone into that deal saying, this is the line in the sand, whether you said it to yourself or to the other party, do not cross that line. Because if you cross that line, then there is another line that either you will draw or the other side will draw for you. So then you will probably have to cross that line too. And then another line will be crossed, and you'll cross that line too. And so what are you doing? You're going closer and closer to the other side. So think about what your deal breaker is, set it firmly, and do not cross it. And that dovetails very well to the last rule, which is you must know that you don't have to make every deal. And sometimes the best deals are those that are never made, because there is nothing worse than a bad deal that you have to live with. If, you, if when you speak, you kind of, in an open thought, you use a lot of uhs and uh, er and whatever, so much so that you're distracting yourself with that, you know what the fix to that is? Close your mouth. You cannot make that noise with a closed mouth. You can't. So you cannot I learned that 30 years ago. You cannot speak so that the other side listens. You cannot give information with an open mouth. Impossible. Because you don't really you don't get to the end of of the line if you truly are not the person that people want to be around because most deals are not, most negotiations are not negotiations that start and end today and that's it. <coughs> Many go on forever. I mean, political negotiations, you know far better than I do, they're, they're almost never over. They're just different levels of completion. So you have to live with that person and it, it behooves both sides to make that as pleasant as possible because even if you have the upper hand, you are going to spend several hours with that person. So why not spend it in a pleasant environment versus an unpleasant environment? Doesn't, you don't get more money at the end of the day if your stomach is tied up in, in a knot because the other side is making it hard, hard for you or whatever. Just tailor it so that if you've got to do what you've got to do, well, have some fun with it. If you didn't put all of your reasons or all, all of your claims, let's say, on the table at the same time. Right. The other side is not going to be happy with you. Right. To some small or large degree. But it's, it's a terrific point. The best question you can always ask is, what, are, what do you have to offer? What are you offering? What are you suggesting? And, and let them come with the offer first, because it may not be an offer you want, or you may be blown away. You know, it could work both ways. But they are showing you their cards. And you don't have to show them that. Take me. Play it dumb. I'm new to this. I don't know what this thing is going for. I mean, just play it dumb. And everything and anything works. What you are looking for is a non-duplicatable advantage from the other side. Get the advantage by having them proffer a number and run with it. You can always go up and down from there. But you can't, you can't do anything to the number unless you know what the baseline is.